Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program will begin in three minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program is about to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Please welcome Hodinkee Editor-at-Large Joe Thompson and watch industry legend Jean-Claude Bieber. Jean-Claude, welcome. Thank you. I want to let everybody know Jean-Claude has come from Zurich today on a day trip just for this event just for the Hodinkee H10. <laughs> he flew to Zurich this morning, and then he'll fly back to Zurich tonight. Uh, a little bit about uh, the program. First of all, if I can ask everybody to put your cell phones on mute. The format will be a few questions from me, and then we want to throw it open to you. You will have seen the title of the, uh, the panel is uh, the past, the present, and the future. It is wide open. Feel free to ask whatever you want. You know his career. Blancpain, Omega, Hublot, Tag Heuer, smartwatches. Whatever you want to ask, ask. Feel free to ask. Um, so, maybe we can start. Yes. The first question is not as simple as it sounds. Uh, the question is, how are you? And by that I mean, uh, we've heard 
uh, the news that you have recently changed your position of LVMH and health reasons were a factor. So can you give us an update on how you're doing and what you're doing? Yes, to fly in and fly out the same day, it saves you a night of hotel. Uh, <laughs> to fly in and to fly out same day should not be a problem for anybody because it's not a distance. It, uh, you know, nine hour flight in, eight hours flight out, everybody could do it. The problem is that people don't have the mentality and people think, oh, this is long. You go to New York. <laughs> My goodness, it's a question of mentality. And that is one thing that is important in life. Everything is here. And I always have considered that I have two separate elements. I am made of two elements, my head and my body. The body is my vehicle. It's a car. And at 3 o'clock in the morning when I get up, I say to the body, get up. And the body says, uh, yes, you get up. And the body gets up. For, at the, during this moment, when the body gets up, my head is still in bed, but the body is up. And then I say to the body, OK, go downstairs to the kitchen, make a coffee. And the body goes down, and he makes a coffee. And then he tells me, coffee ready. <laughs> and OK, I say, then the head gets up and the head comes down uh, to the body. Thank you, body. And I drink my coffee. And then I say to the body, now bring me to my office. I have to check a few mails. And the body brings me to the, to the computer, to my office. So when you have this separation, you can do anything with your body. There is no limit. Now, because there is no limit, I have treated the body as if he would be eternal. The body, I realized, uh, has <laughs> a limited time uh, <laughs> to live. And probably mine will be like 100 years. Uh, <laughs> Uh, nevertheless, although my head thinks that the body will last for another 30 years, last year, I don't know what happened to the body, but he needed some service. Um, and uh, I had to slow down because I couldn't ask him anymore because this poor guy was sick. So the body went to hospital. I stayed at home, but the body went to hospital. <laughs> <laughs> The body went to hospital and he got injections and this, cortisone, all this normal treatment you get in the hospitals. And the treatment um, <laughs> started in <clears throat> September last year and the body still needs treatment today. So every day cortisone and once a week chemotherapy. And uh, for me, my head now believes and I tell the body, hey, now it's enough. Stop it. So I said to him, let's make a trial. Let's see if we travel. Let's see how you react. So in the last three weeks, I went every week, one time to Asia, back home Switzerland, and then to America. The week after, one time to Asia, back home for one night, boom, and to America. And this week, I came back on Thursday from Hong Kong, and today I'm in New York. Uh, and the body, you know what? He says, God damn, I had lost to get used to this treatment, but I feel very well. I said, wow, so now we are partners again. He said, yes, we can, we can start again. Okay. <laughs> so that was the answer. <laughs> Let's go back to 1982 and Blancpain. 
Uh, and if you allow me just for the gang to set up the stage so that everybody understands, because I'm guessing that not everybody remembers 1982 as well as we do. Uh, in 1982, you and your buddy, Jacques Piguet, acquire the rights to the Blancpain brand. Also in 1982, coincidentally, in San Antonio, Texas, ETA, ETA is test marketing, test marketing, the Swatch Watch. So for you to be thinking about a mechanical brand at that period is really early. This is way before the mechanical watch revival. This is in the thick of the quartz watch crisis. And obviously, the Tommy and Etta, they were trying to shift from mechanical technology to quartz technology to save the industry. You come not only to market, you come to market not only with a mechanical brand, but a dead mechanical brand, dormant for two decades on an anti-quartz platform. Tell us, why did you do that? Because of Confucius. Confucius, because I was a hippie and we were reading Confucius, although we didn't understand much, but <laughs> it was important to have the book. <laughs> so once you have the book, means you understand. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, and Confucius said many things, but one of those important elements that I remember and that I understood, only the dead fish swims with the current river, and you have a current, the dead fish goes with the current. The fish that is alive goes left, right of the, of the current, or back or if he goes in the direction of the current, he goes two times quicker than the current. And the dead fish stinks, and stinks from the head. This is why you must always check the head. So I said when we were hippie, God damn, we will never want to be dead fish. Which means I have developed a philosophy always to be different, always to be first always to be unique. If you are first, different, unique, you cannot lose. It's like if you pay, play poker and you have four aces in the, your hand, you cannot lose. It's impossible. So, that was my mentality. Always be first, different, unique. Always to swim against the current, which means in the stock market to be contrarian, to buy when everybody is in panic and sells. Uh, your big boss, uh, Warren Buffett, is a specialist of doing this. Now all the guys are selling, selling, the stock market will go to bankrupt, everything will disappear, and people are selling like crazy. And the people that are contrarian, they stay quiet and they buy. Every day a little bit. At the end, you make a fortune by being contrarian. So, by b being driven to be contrarian, being driven to be first, different, unique, and being driven by the hippie mentality. You know, in Europe today, there's a big problem with the climate. In America, the president doesn't believe in it, but the Europeans know how they are. They are very much uh, left-sided, they think left, and when you are left, you are in the romantic world, you are in the world of generosity, you are in the world of sharing, and as a hippie, we were in this world, and we believed in bio. Today in Europe we start to eat bio. Okay, maybe it's real or fake, but at, it, at least they sell you as if it would be bio. And I was used uh, when, in 1966 to eat bio. Later I gave it up. But in this period we were very keen to eat very special rice. We were not buying Uncle Ben's. We had special rice because Uncle Ben's was a white rice and rice is not white. So it already it has been transformed. And we were always thinking that what is the most important. Nature, planet Earth is our God. That was our belief. If this is your belief, then you also believe in a fountain pay, a pen. Fountain pen 
Meisterstück Mont Blanc. This was the pen we were using. Everybody, nobody was using this fountain pens in the, in, the, in the end of the 70s. But we were using it, and we were writing with this ink. We were fond of Jaguar inside Connolly leather. Connolly leather, the smell. You enter the car, wow, you don't need to drive anymore. That's the beauty of those cars, uh, which is good because sometimes they don't work. <laughs> so you don't care. <laughs> in the atmosphere. So, being driven by all this, how could we adhere, how could we go into quartz? Quartz is not a watch, it's an instrument of technology, it's a computer, it has a battery, it has a microchip. So, we said, this is not the future because the future is something that is connected to eternity. What is connected to eternity? Of course, God, if you believe in God. <clears throat> but what, is, what else, if you don't believe in God? What else is connected to eternity? Art. The art of Mozart is still here. Every day, millions of people are listening to Mozart, or to the Beatles, or looking at Picasso. Art is eternal. The art of the group. So Weber said, art is eternal, and watchmaking art is also eternal. Big Ben, 150 years old, it still works. There is no instrument on planet Earth that works after 150 years. There's no mechanical uh, uh, engine or instrument that works after 150 years, except watches. And Big Ben, 24 hours, every second it works. And it has never stopped to work. So we believed in this theory of eternity. And being driven by those elements that I have now mentioned, it was very natural that we were going contrarian and that we said in the Blanc advertisement, the day I sold the, the brand, a few years later I left management and uh, I, I, I quit from the management and they immediately changed our uh, slogan. And our slogan, our headline was, since 1735, there has never been a Blancpain watch, a Blancpain quartz watch, dot, and there will never be one. Wow. And people were reading this in the newspaper, saying, how can these people say that when everybody says it's the, it's the quartz watch that will save the industry? So we were completely contrarian. And being contrarian, we opened a niche of people that were like us. They came from the hippie uh, uh, time. We all had the same mentality. So we had this new generation in the 80s. We were all 40 years old. And these people suddenly had the power, had the sufficient uh, money to buy a watch. Cheap or uh, not cheap, but uh, a simple uh, quartz watch. So this is why we did it. There was another reason, because there are sometimes many reasons. The fourth reason was that my partner is Jacques Piguet. And Jacques Piguet is the boss, owner, of Frédéric Piguet. And Frédéric Piguet is among the finest Swiss movement maker that has ever existed. His grand-grandfather was called Louis-Élysée Piguet the most beautiful grand complication, grand sonnery, sonnery, repetition minute, were all from Louis Elise Piguet. And Jacques Piguet, in 1980, in 1981, in 1982, but in 81, he had nine people working in his factory. Nine, not ten, nine. Why? <laughs> because he was going bankrupt because nobody wanted mechanical watches. Everybody wanted quartz, 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 quartz. And Jacques had an interest to partner with me and to relaunch, thanks to Blancpain, the mechanical watch. So we played a role as a market opener. We had to open the market, and that role we played. And there was one company 
one gentleman, one great man that I admire, that I respect, and that is why I collect, was Mr. Philip Stern from Patek Philippe. He wrote a letter in 1982 because we had a big ad in a Swiss newspaper since 1735. There's never been a blanc par quartz, and there will never be one. He wrote us a letter and said, congratulations, I wish you good luck. That is why we went mechanical. Very good. You were, though, flowing against the tide. Maybe you can talk to us about launching the brand and going to your, your first Basel Fair, going there with a brand nobody's heard of and a technology nobody wants. How'd that work out? Yes, when you are, uh, when, uh, nobody, uh, when you are a startup, we were a startup because <laughs> uh, we bought the brand for 22,000 US dollars, uh, but the brand was not existing. It was just the name. The brand had gone out of business 20 years before. Um, and we didn't have, uh, yeah, we didn't have money. That's it. And when you have no money, we went to Basel Fair with a camping bus. And we were sleeping in the camping bus. It was a Volkswagen Westfalia, which is a, great, a, nice, a nice camping bus. I bought one then when I had the money. Uh, I bought one 10 years ago. And I said to my wife, now we're going with camping bus to Greece. She said, what? Yeah, and we take the dogs, and, and we take the kids, all in the Westphalia camping bus, going to Greece uh, with the camping bus. <laughs> so you see, I've never forgotten this incredible period of the camping bus. And so we were sleeping in the camping bus uh, behind the Basel Fair, near the railway station, and uh, in the morning we had to shave and to, to clean, so <laughs> we went to the railway station, putting uh, uh, one Swiss franc and shower for three minutes. Uh, so, <laughs> and then we went with a nice tie, uh, went to Basel Fair, and we said, where do you stay? We said, well, we stay in the Hilton. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but we had to catch attention. And in order to catch attention, because we had no collection, Blancpain was one watch. It was a moon phase watch, one watch. And it existed in two uh, versions, uh, 33 millimeter and 33.3 millimeter diameter. And we had one version in steel and one steel and gold. And that's it, only two. If you have two watches and you have a boost, and in those days in the Basel Fair, everybody was showing watches. So uh, brands had 30, 40 watches in their different showcases. As we had only two watches to show, and you know, if you show two, it makes very poor, we decided we show none. <laughs> so we had the boost with a wall, no showcase. <laughs> and everybody came and looked, what's that? And it was written, instead of her, it was written Blanca. We said, ah, Blanca, Blanca, we never heard about it. Or some people said, I remember 30 years ago. But what are they doing? So we had to catch attention. Because we showed no watches, everybody spoke about us. And everybody, and everybody said, have you seen the watch? <laughs> <laughs> so that was our strategy. We had another, you know, when you are startup, you must think startup. This is why big groups, they can never develop a startup in theory. Because big groups, they don't think startup. They think uh, consolidated and technocracy. So uh, there was another element. In the beginning, we had uh, customers, and customers were a little bit reluctant. And we had a strategy, and it worked very well in Zermatt, Zermatt Ski Resort, to buy our watches in the shop. And in Zermatt, <laughs> There's a shop called uh, Schindler, uh, and uh, Schindler, he was reluctant. I was making a, a running marathon with him, but even I was running a marathon, he said, <laughs> I don't want your watch. <laughs> okay, okay. So um, finally, he bought two, one and one. I mean, it's two, it was $2,000 huh, to buy. But in the mountains, people are very careful, and $2,000 is a lot of money in the mountains. 
they, uh, you know, <laughs> they think really, uh, that's why they are so rich at the end. Uh, <laughs> you find more rich people up in the mountains than in the cities. <laughs> so Schindler bought two. I have sent friends, I said, okay, you go to Zermatt, and so I gave the money, and uh, my friend went up and bought the watch. He spent a nice day in Zermatt, it was nice, he skied, and he bought a watch. And then I, <laughs> my do my, uh, the, the sister of my wife, uh, I said to her the same, you buy a watch. So they went for the weekend, they bought a watch. On Monday morning, Schindler calls me, God damn, I sold the two watches. <laughs> I'm going to buy five. <laughs> and so that's how we started, you know, and we did this. We did this with uh, many other people. So, uh... <laughs> one, one, more, one more on this phase, and it'll be the last for me in this round, and we'll throw it open. So think about your questions. But you also managed, somehow, to open the great Tiffany and Company here in New York City. How'd you do that? <laughs> yes, uh, I played the same game, more or less. I made, <laughs> I made an appointment with uh, Mr. Tiffany uh, Kowalski. 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 He was the boss of uh, buying. He was purchasing department. And I got, the I got in touch with him by phone. And um, yeah, I said, listen, I <laughs> I am in Switzerland, um, I'm interested to see you, to sell uh, you my brand. He said, blah, 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 blah. I, uh, I'm not so much interested, don't lose time with me. I said, no, no, we will not lose time. Probably you have a little uh, sandwich at, at, uh, for lunch and uh, we can eat the sandwich together. And while eating we can speak and if after 20 minutes I have told you uh, nothing interesting, at least you haven't spoken. <laughs> and he agreed. <laughs> so uh, he said yes, and I said, I come uh, tomorrow. He said, ah, I'll come. I said, I take the Concord. But I was already in New York. <laughs> so, Everybody remembers the Concorde, right? No, uh, Three and a half hours, flew, uh, hours to New York. And in reality, I flew with, uh, with a very cheap t a ticket, uh, which was called standby. You had to wait <laughs> till, till they call you and say, hey, we have three tickets. And you were running, <laughs> buying one for 180 Swiss francs. So uh, yeah, that, this was the type of tricks we did. We also did at Basel Fair one year, when we showcases because we were obliged. The Basel Fair told us if you don't put showcases, this wall we don't want next year. We want that you do, like the other booths, a nice showcases. So we did showcases. And on Wednesday evening, the fair opens Friday, uh, Thursday. On Wednesday evening, my friend who worked with me said, what a shit that we have these showcases. <laughs> Uh, it's terrible. Uh, people will just think that we are like the others. I said, yes. At least here they will think that, that we are like the others. He said, you know what? I will break the showcase. I said, what? So he took a hammer, bam! <laughs> and he broke the showcase. And I said, and now leave it like this. And people will be surprised when the fair opened to see this. And we, will, we can all Hey, somebody has stolen. Somebody has. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so we broke the showcase, <laughs> and there was a broken showcase on the other morning, and that made the news. So it's always <laughs> when you are a startup, you must be in the news, uh, <laughs> especially when you have no money. So there was nothing dangerous, it, it is romantic what we did, it was, you know, harmless. But these little tricks, uh, people that go to Harvard Business School, they no, don't learn them. This is why I go every year. <laughs> <laughs> that is why I go every year to Harvard and I tell the boys and uh, girls that are there what we did. 
because technocracy I cannot teach, but startup development I can teach. So uh, I wrote a little book for the Harvard Business School for the students where I mention all these little tricks which are, you know, very harmless, it's a little bit naive, but it works. And I think today in our technocratic world, it works even better than before. So whoever is in a startup, he can, I will give him my address and I can send a few tricks. All right, on, on that one point, I didn't know you would bring this up. I'll make one comment. Uh, Professor Ryan Raffaelli has done a study, a Harvard Business School study based on John Claude's career. And I happen to know Professor Raffaelli is a lovely guy. We both know him independently. And he told me the story that, oh, it's great. John Claude comes to speak to my students every year. And he's so inspirational, but he can be like a little too inspirational. <laughs> he told me that after hearing you, one young lady who was attending the Harvard Business School dropped out <laughs> based on the, the, the themes you've just been talking about. All right, who has some questions for John claude Beaver? Yes, sir. So, uh, Mr. Beaver. Please speak into the mics. That's right. We have mics just to let everybody know because we're simulcasting. So p please wait for the mic. Okay, Mr. Beaver, uh, a year and a half ago, I was very lucky to hear you come and speak in Springfield, New Jersey. And at that time, you invited us to ask questions. And it took me a while to come up with this. So uh, with Blancpain, with Omega, with Hublot, with Zenith, with Tag Heuer, you have come into these organizations and in a short period of time clarified the vision of the brand. And I wonder if you could please talk a little bit about what you've done to develop that skill and what you do to maintain the clarity of your thinking? I think it's uh, the fact of the brand. You know, if you take Karl Lagerfeld, he works for a few brands, but you will never notice that it is Karl Lagerfeld because he will respect each brand for itself. When he designs for Chanel, it's typically Chanel. And many designers or many CEOs, they want to put their own trace, their own mark. And that is the worst thing you can do because you will die much earlier than the brand. The brand is the boss and you have to adapt to the brand. If you design, if you do, if I design a Tag Heuer watch like I like it, I'm wrong because I should design a Tag Heuer watch for the Tag Heuer customer, not for me. Wow, this, the, ah, Mr. Bill, how can you design such a watch? I say, what are you talking about? Yeah, but I don't like it at all. But that's not the problem. You, I, I'm not designing it for you. I'm designing it for the Tag Heuer customer and I respect the brand. In order to respect the brand, you must be humble. Respect is an act of love. You must have a, a certain, yeah, you must be humble. And you must uh, 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 go down deep into the tradition in the brand. I used to say, before we touch, we must speak to the death. We must go to the cemetery where we have 1,300 people that are buried. They all have worked for Zenit, and we, we have to talk to these people. How do we talk? You go to the cemetery and you just stay for one hour and you do nothing and you think about Zenith. You just think. Slowly, slowly, you get the language of the death is coming up from the graves. They tell you the story and you get it. And the more you get these stories, the more you will understand what they have done, the more you will understand their passion, the more you will understand how much love they have put in the, in the brand. And as soon as you have understood it, you will say, God damn, I cannot damage this. I must continue it. I am not here to, to change it. I must continue. That is what I call the respect and the humility you must have when you enter a brand. And when you do that, you enter the DNA of the brand. And once you are in the DNA of the brand, you know where you go. Of course, <coughs> what was right in 1932 is not necessarily right today, 
but the DNA can be the same. I don't look like when I was 18 today, but my DNA is still the same. My fingerprints are the same. So that is the important element that many, 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 many people forget. You know, even simple designer, you go for an advertising uh, um, uh, concept, they will, they, or you go to an architect for your house, they want to impose their views to you. And I always say to these guys, come on, I'm the boss, and I, I'm here to defend the brand, and the brand is telling you that this is not right. How can you say that? You must be modern, you must connect to the future. I say, fuck you. I, <laughs> I, I must. I must. I must not connect to the future. I must connect first to the brand. And once I am connected to the brand, then I go with the brand to the future. All right, let's so have another one. I, I can't say any other one. Hand in the back. There's a, a hand raised. I'm sorry, I can barely see. Oh, look who it is. <laughs> look who it is. What's happening, people? Uh, Mr. Rivera, lovely to speak to you. Honor your work. Um, look. I'm a designer starting up a company myself, brother, so I understand exactly what you're saying. I'm of the belief that there is no such thing as negativity or a loss in a situation. I believe there's always an opportunity in what may present itself as a loss or a deficit. So my question to you is, what, has been, what have been some of your greatest reactions or responses to maybe a loss or a downturn in business? Yes, uh, this is a, it's a good question because you are right. A loss cannot be a loss. I always say, uh, if you have no failures, you will never have a success. <laughs> uh, you can only go to success thanks to steps that are bringing you up, and each step is a failure. Failure one, boom. And then you do a second one. It means you have to do a series of mistakes or failures before you reach uh, success. That is my theory. Because of this, I must forgive my people. If I cannot accept the failures of my people, my people will stay afraid of initiatives and they will not be dynamic. They will be passive. A dynamic manager, a dynamic person, is a person that will make mistakes. And I suggest, which I say to the Howard uh, uh, students and to all the other universities, I said, hey guys, you are 25, 23 years old. Come on, do mistakes. You should have one mistake a week. And then that means you are progressing. If you have no failures, if you have no mistake, that means you are not taking any risk. So the mistake, the failure process is extremely important, especially for young people. And it's important to do the big mistakes when you are young because you have 50 years to recover. If I do a big mistake at 70 years old, I don't have much time to recover. So it's better that I have done the mistakes before. Uh, so the mistake policy is extremely important. I have done at Hublot uh, failure meetings once every three months. People come and every mistakes he did. And in the beginning, nobody had done a mistake. So I said, you are all sleeping. This is why Hublot is so bad. I want, <laughs> I, I want mistakes. <laughs> and then after the next one, it was three months later, so it was after six months, again, nobody had a mistake to communicate. So I said, next time, the next session, I will pay $1,000 per mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so the next time, a young man said, I did a mistake. <laughs> ah, finally. Okay, which one? Because we wanted to learn, you know? If I share with you my mistakes, you will learn from my mistakes, and then you share the ones with me. So he said, ah, I bought some bags um, for the drivers, you know, to put the, the box uh, in, the, in the bag. Okay, and what? Yes, I bought 100,000. 
bags. I said, pardon, 100,000? <laughs> we are producing 8,900 watches per year. Uh, <laughs> he said, yes, I ordered 100,000 because I got a better price. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Benjamin, is that possible? He said, yes, you asked me to tell you mistakes. That was one of my mistakes. Uh, I said, okay, I will, I will call the bookkeeper, Mr. Orio. I called Mr. Orio. I said, Mr. Orio, please prepare a check of 1,000 Swiss francs for Benjamino. He just gave us a mistake. Uh, and before Mr. Orio, the bookkeeper, could come, Benjamino said, ah, but that's not all. <laughs> I said, ah, I want 2,000 <laughs> because I did another mistake. <laughs> so he said, I said, what's that? No, no, it's just a consequence. Because 100,000 is such a volume. Hublot was in a small apartment of, uh, you know, we, did, it was, we were 30 people, or 29 people. So it was very small. And he said, we cannot store them. So we had to rent a garage. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, uh, uh, now, from which mistakes have I learned? <laughs> um, I have learned from the mistakes of others <laughs> more than from myself because I have never been somebody who takes a decision alone. I listen to people. You know, I'm driven by something that people hate. <laughs> it's my doubt. The doubt is my friend. And I have incredible doubts. <laughs> and uh, um, the doubt is my friend. But my wife says sometimes the doubt is your enemy. Because when the doubt comes, I am quiet, I can, I'm not laughing, I'm not talking. I am together with the doubt, and I'm fighting with him. And the doubt wakes me up at 2 o'clock in the morning, 1 o'clock, and I cannot sleep anymore. And I have to go down, and I have to check. So I'm talking with the doubt constantly. And then I have, third peop uh, I have other people that are around me, and I talk to them too. Once people have given me their uh, uh, opinion. Once I have checked several times with my doubts, I make a decision. So usually the decision that I make is not done, bam, on the spot. It's, it's, it seems quick, maybe for certain people, but not quick for me because I, I work a lot. So I have not made uh, so many, but there's one mistake I have learned not to make anymore. It's to think that when you buy a luxury product, a $100,000 watch, which is very unusual, but there are quite some people, that how long will it take when you have done a $100,000 watch till this customer who wears a $100,000 watch buys a second one? And we used, and I have corrected this, we used to believe it takes a few years because we, were, we knew that if somebody buys a $1,000 watch, it takes him seven to 10 years before he buys a second one. And the 100,000 must be at least the same. The $100,000 watch, it takes eventually three months, and then he buys a second one. Uh, maximum five months. So he will buy two to three pieces. At Blancpain. So it means we had people putting our watch on the wrist, and because they wanted the second one at the same price, or even more expensive, they couldn't find it. Because we had our collection, our concept, we didn't want to make too many pieces. With Hublot, I have learned that we have never, we must never lose the wrist. If somebody wears a Hublot, he must wear Hublot for 10 years. But as he buys three a year, we must provide him sufficient varieties, sufficient uh, 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 argumentation, so that he can buy three every year. But how can he buy three if we have a mono product? By making special edition, by making special pieces, limited edition. And all the collectors, the serious collectors, they all, uh, all uh, a special edition. Hublot makes only special edition. Of course, because we, are go we don't want to lose the risk of people who are buying 
three watches a year. And uh, so this is a mistake that I have done once with Blancpain, not to feed the people who buy three or five watches at 100,000 with Hublot, thanks to the special edition. And why this special edition? Because we want the basic collection always to be clean. And then we do here, left and right, special edition that disappear as soon as they are sold out. So we keep a very clean collection, in fact, for the production because 80% is our core business and 20% are the special edition that they have, uh, uh, when they have been sold out. And how can they die when they are sold out? Because when we do the piece and we say, oh God, how many, how many can we sell? Oh, Mr. Beaver, we can sell 500 pieces. Okay, let's make 250. Another one, how many can, how much can, we, can, how many can we sell? Mm, maybe 200, let's make 100. It means we have always done half of the potential that we thought so that the special edition is sold out as soon as possible. Because as soon as it is sold out, there is no trace because we can keep the core collection going on. All right, let's take another one. Question? All right, sir. Um, Mr. Beaver, uh, you, you uh, are a contrarian and have shaken up the watch industry. And for many of us collectors, the tourbillon was the, the ultimate complication. And a couple of years ago, uh, TAG came out with a, I don't want to call it an affordable, but a, a in accessible, accessible uh, tourbillon. What impact did that strategically have on the rest of the watch industry and where can we see it go from, from here? First of all, I think it has taught people that the tourbillon is not the ultimate masterpiece. The ultimate masterpiece is, thanks God, the miniature Peter. And after the miniature Peter is the split second chronograph. <laughs> and believe me, a split second chronograph is a hell of a lot more difficult to produce than a tourbillon. So it has put uh, a new <laughs> uh, truth. And it has, of course, probably uh, hurt some belief because it's more easy to believe that the tourbillon is the ultimate. Now, why have we done it? Because that is the, 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 that is the first uh, answer. We have done it because the message of the brand called Tag Heuer is to be avant-garde, T-A-G, technique avant-garde. So we have to be avant-garde. Number two, we have to be the accessible luxury brand. Those two elements were extremely important. And number three, we must have a perceived value that is double our retail price. So when we were fixing the price, we were saying, it looks like a $50,000 watch. Okay, let's try to make it for 20,000. The perceived value of the tourbillon of Tag Heuer is at least 50 or 60,000. But how can we achieve to make a perceived value at 60,000 and to make the two at 50, at 20? Because we, the whole thinking has changed. We said from beginning on, from the first moment we designed it, guys, there's no way you design anything that we can not sell at 20. And this is now, the, uh, you, uh, you must follow this order. Before, people were designing tourbillons, but they didn't care so much what is the end cost price, because everybody was used to pay 100,000, 60,000 for tourbillon. And we said we must be avant-garde, we must be accessible luxury, and we must have perceived value, because that's our message. So I don't change my message. This is the message. So we have built, we have constructed the tourbillon in a way 
that we can sell it for 20,000 and make the same profit as on a normal Carrera. So, the, the th of course, it has probably hurt some people. But if it has hurt people, that is because those people were not at their right place. It hasn't hurt Patek Philippe. It hasn't hurt AP. It has hurt even not Hublot. <laughs> It ha we have not seen that we were selling one tourbillon less because Tag Heuer is making a tourbillon. So you see, it was right for the normal big brands, it has maybe brought illusions in the eyes of certain uh, customers or collectors who believe that the tourbillon is the ultimate masterpiece. But you can ask your watchmaker, it's not true. The ultimate masterpiece is the miniature Peter, and below the miniature Peter is the chronograph split second, which is a hell of a damn thing to, to build. Um, and then eventually the perpetual calendar. And then I would put tourbillon. So in my hierarchy, and I'm not a watchmaker, you, you can discuss, but what is never to be discussed is miniature Peter is the most important, difficult. Second most important and difficult is the chrono split. And then people say tourbillon, I say uh, perpetual, and then I put tourbillon. All right, we're over, but we're going to keep going. So make sure I get, are there any questions? Okay, go ahead. Thank you, sir. Mr. Bouvet, I was fortunate to buy a few of your watches in auctions in the past. So my question is around collectors. Do you still collect watches? And do you get excited about any new watch that you buy? I still buy, yes. I have sold a certain, okay. When you collect, you sometimes buy what you don't need, which is the beauty of collection. <laughs> <laughs> That's the real beauty. You buy what you don't need. Uh, and what you don't need intellectually in the collection. But after a certain period, you realize that there are elements in the collection of your wine or your watches or your cars that you don't need. Because in the enthusiasm of the beginning, slowly, you, uh, get, you concentrate on the essence. And I have sold a few pieces that were not among the most important or, or that had not a real role to play in my collection. Now, I still have pleasure in buying. I still have pleasure in looking at my collection. And I have, I have even more pleasure than ever because my youngest son has a real passion for my collection. And uh, because this young man, 18 years old, he has a real, real passion I have asked uh, Mr. Stern on uh, four watches that I have bought, which were unique pieces, to put the name of my son and to engrave it in the watch and to put the certificate of origin, the authenticity of Pierre Biver, not my name. And this has uh, they have accepted to do that at Patek, and that has given me an enormous uh, emotion. And recently, we looked at the collection, and suddenly Pierre said, Ah, Papa, there's my name. Uh, so uh, 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 I still have this uh, uh, pleasure and the respect and the beauty to own, uh, uh, to own, to have my collection. But the collection has been reduced to the most important pieces. Question in the back at all? All right, uh, I have a question. You've mentioned um, a couple of times, Philippe Cern. I was going to ask you, look, you're a hero to many. Who is your hero in the Swiss watch industry? Do you have someone who you... I have, he I have heroes that are now dead. My first hero is Gérald Janta. Gerald Genta, I worked with him in 1974, and I worked with him till 1982. And then I worked again with him in 2005. And Gerald Genta, in 1979, we were traveling in the, in, uh, to Italy looking for a supplier of gold bracelets uh, called Fontana. 
in Sesto Calendi. And uh, we were on the train next to the lake. And this, this is the lake, Lake Guarda, Guarda uh, Gol, uh, La, uh, Lake. And there's a small island or so, a few islands in the middle. And, we are, and I said to him, Mr. Genta, I was telling him Mr. Genta in those days, I was a little boy, a little kid, I was 30 years old. I said, Mr. Genta, do you think I can uh, put yellow, uh, um, blue and green on the dial? I have a request from a customer who wants to have green and blue. Do you think those colors are matching? And Gerald Genta said, Mr. Beaver, what a stupid question. You know, he was very expressive. He was a little bit Italian uh, <laughs> with the moustache. <laughs> he was a little bit like Salvador Dali. And uh, <laughs> what a stupid question. I said, uh, sorry, Mr. Genta, what, what is stupid? Stupid that you ask me, how can I know that? I said, OK. But who, 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 can, who can give me answer? He said, there's only one who can answer you. This is the creator, or God. I said, OK, I am a Catholic, <laughs> but I have not been to church for many years now. I don't know how to talk to God. <laughs> and he said, but you don't need to talk to God. God is talking to you. Look out of the window. And I look out of the window, we're on the train. And what do you see? I say the lake and uh, an island. OK, the lake is, is blue. Yes, because it was very nice sunny day. Island was green. And I said blue and green. He said, you see, that is the answer. <laughs> Not me. I cannot answer. God gave you now the answer. And God is, uh, the creator, is the one who made planet Earth. From now on, you will ask him never again to me. But I can now tell you that in the market for the moment, this will not sell. <laughs> Let's keep going. One, one more. A few more. Yes, sir. As, um, as someone who's evolved yeah, the no. watch um, industry over the last few decades, how do you predict the watch industry will be different in, say, let's say, 20 years from now compared to where it is now? I believe that in 20 years, probably the Swiss watch industry might have doubled their turnover. Uh, which means, OK, in 20 years, double is OK. If the stock market doubles in 20 years, maybe people might think it's not enough. But for an industry to double in 20 years or 25 years, I think it's not bad. Why do I think we will double in 25 years or, or 20 or, or 30? Because more and more, we will need to connect to eternity. We are every day connected to what becomes obsolete. Everything gets obsolete because everything that we are surrounded with comes from technology. And technology goes into the future by killing the past. I, a few weeks ago, I saw the first phone where I, I saw it. I was there. The guy uh, made a selfie with me a video a selfie and then he said okay you have we have made the selfie mr beaver let's see the video of the selfie we just did he pushed no and i see on the phone three dimension no glasses nothing i saw three dimension i said but that's incredible he said yes this is my company uh, we have a startup and we will do billions because this technology we are now we are ready we're going to sell it etc it means the day every phone is in 3d who will buy a phone that we have today so technology kills the past 
while art goes to the future by connecting to eternity. And we, how many engines, how many things you are surrounded with that you can say in 50 years those will still be there and they will be useful. There, there aren't any. It's finished. Even cars today, because of all the chips that are in the cars, in 20, 30, 50 years, he, they, people will not be able to repair because when the chips, microchips doesn't exist, it's finished. So I believe we will need to come back to something that keeps us connected to the eternity. And this is what connects us the most is love and art. And watches made in a certain way are synonymous of art. I say the watchmaking art. Of course, in a quartz watch, I'm sorry for those who wear quartz, who love quartz. Quartz is not an art, it's a technology. While a tourbillon or a split second or a nice uh, three hands automatic watch is a piece of art. And it will work in 50 years, in 100 years. So I believe w as more we go into technology, the more people, because we are human beings, we need to be connected to love and to art and to eternity. And one way to connect is through a watch. So I believe the watchmaking art, the Swiss watchmaking art will double the turnover in 25 or 30 years. All right, we're going to keep rolling then as long as there are questions. Are there other questions? Yes, thank you. Uh, this weekend we've heard a lot of people talk about the emotional connections they have with watches. So is there a certain watch that you have a particular like, sentimental value in? Yes, I have. Uh, um, one is the, I have a Nautilus from 1976 and I have a big emotion because when Nautilus came out in 1976 at AP, I was working for AP at that time, we got very angry and we said, they, they, they copy us. <laughs> uh, of course, they didn't copy, but they copied the spirit. The spirit of Nautilus is, is the name of a boat. Royal Oak is the name of a boat. Both were in steel. In those days, luxury watches were very, didn't exist in steel. Um, and both were meant uh, for the world of yachting. And this Nautilus, I said, wow, wow, we were always against it. And one day I had the chance to buy it. <laughs> and buying made me good, you know. <laughs> and I said to Mr. Philip Stern, I said, you know, I was so happy to buy this Nautilus uh, <laughs> because it remembers me all the fighting I had to do against the watch. And now I buy the watch. So. <laughs> Questions? But that's just one. I have many emotions in uh, other stories like that. Okay, question in the back. Hey, how's it going? Uh, in the mid-2000s, when Hayek decided that most brands needed to make their own movements, a lot of companies struggled with that, and a lot of companies had to raise their prices to do so. A lot of companies made their own manufacturers. And what happened in the last decade, the prices have skyrocketed. It, they're more than double than like, what we remember 15 years ago. My question to you is, did that, I understood why he did it, because he said that he, need, he didn't need to do it for the ingenuity for Switzerland to be original and stop relying on him for movements. But that eventually kind of rested on the backs of the consumer. Did that help the watch industry? Or did it hurt us? So the price increase we are referring to is just uh, what we forget in this uh, theory of prices is the dollar. <laughs> uh, the Swiss franc is, has become so strong. When I started, okay, that's a long time ago, in 1974, one US dollar, you could get 4.75 Swiss francs, nearly five. Now, for one dollar, you get this morning 99 cents. So as we are produce, and that's just for the dollar, it's even worse for the Italian lira, which doesn't exist anymore. But, uh, <laughs> 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 uh, so <laughs> uh, you can imagine the, when the dollar has weakened so much versus the Swiss franc, what happened to other currencies? It's even worse. 
So the, the, uh, that is why, that is one reason why watches have increased their prices. <laughs> as we produce in Swiss francs, as we pay in Swiss francs, <laughs> uh, the salaries are Swiss salaries. <laughs> uh, of course, that gives us an, uh, an important price increase just because of the currency. Now, to come back to your question, the fact that Mr. Hayek uh, decided not to deliver his knowledge to everybody, I was a supporter of this. <laughs> I said to him several times, when are we going to stop delivering our competition with our own weapons? <coughs> Is if you would sell today the best weapons of the US Army to your friends from Russia. I would say, are you crazy, you Americans? How can you sell your best weapons uh, to the Chinese or to the uh, Russians? You don't sell uh, to others what is making your own st uh, strong. And I remember, and I'm a friend of um, Teddy Schneider, the, owner, former, uh, the former owner of Breitling, he was buying from us movements, chronograph movements, and we were trying to sell chronograph watches from Omega. I, I relaunched the Speedmaster in 1992, and I had enormous difficulties because the retailers were telling us, no, no, from Omega, I don't want the chronograph. I buy chronograph from Breitling. Fucking shit, it's my, it's, it's my movement. <laughs> it's my movement. Omega chronograph because we have sold to Breitling chronograph and he is taking the market. So I was always in favor. I said to Mr. Hayek, one day it's good that you stop delivering to competition what is making our own strengths. Uh, finally, he did it. Was, and now the next question you ask, was that right or wrong? I think it was right because it gave more credibility to the brands. And when the brand has its own movement, it gives authenticity, it gives credibility. If Hayek would have delivered me to, Blau, to Hublot the chronograph, which I wanted, 1185 from Frederick Piguet, I made an order. I said, Mr. Hayek, please deliver me. And he said, no, okay. The 1185 Piguet, the best chronograph movement in the world, in my opinion. Uh, why? Because it's ultra slim. And number two, it's the only chronograph in the world where you have the best amplitude when the chronograph is working. On all the other chronograph, it, you, they, and they, you can look uh, in the instruction booklets, which I have also from Patek, from others, you must stop your chronograph once you have finished to action it because if you let it run, you lose amplitude and the, the, the accuracy is not the same. While on the 1185, because I asked for it, because I always have my chronograph working, because I like the movement, I like to see it working. If, if, if it stops, you don't know if your watch is working or not. So uh, we built the 1185, it's functioning the best accuracy. So it's a fantastic movement. I think uh, El Primero and 1185, wow, are references. But Mr. Hayek didn't want to deliver it to me. So because he didn't want to deliver, Hublot built a manufacturer. Probably if I would have got as many 1185 from Piguet as I wanted, I would have used them, I would have bought them, I would have had the same success in quantities that I sell, but I would not have a manufacturer and I would not produce 15,000 chronographs myself. So the effect was positive, I believe, although there was some pain in the beginning, of course. There was pain in the beginning, but at the end, I think it was profitable for the industry. Let's have another one or two and then we'll stop. Okay, gentlemen in the middle because I know you want to meet John Claude as well so we'll stop and give you time for that after uh, the after the panel
Mr. Beaverd, I was just wondering what brands you have the most respect for. You mentioned Thierry Stern, you mentioned, um, you know, we referred to a number of brands, but from a strategy point of view, from a product point of view, what are your favorite brands right now? And in particular, I'm curious uh, what your view is uh, with regards to Rolex, who seems to have a strategy very different from that of Hublot and, and perhaps Omega as well in terms of not producing um, endless series of limited edition uh, products. You know, I have five kids. Which one do I love the most? <laughs> it's very difficult to answer. I love them all, but they are different. And among them, there are two girls and three boys. And I love them all the same, but differently. And I swear, this is a good answer for my watchers. I love many brands, but for different reasons. So just to mention the brands that are coming now to my spirit, you mentioned it. I love Rolex. Sorry uh, if you think this is wrong, but I love Rolex. <laughs> and I think they do a great job. And I believe that thanks to Rolex, uh, many retailers can survive. <laughs> and many retailers can buy exotic or small brands that are not selling. <laughs> because they do the turnover with Rolex, they do the money with Rolex, and then they can devote some money for brands that are not selling so well. Uh, so I have a lot of admiration for Rolex. I have a lot of admiration for the other brand which is next to Rolex is Patek. Because I believe Patek is the history of watchmaking. They have done so much contribution to the development of the, in, of the watchmaking art. So much that they could stop uh, 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 developing, they could stop producing, they would still for the next 50 years be the number one because their contribution in the past is enormous. I have a lot of uh, 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 admiration also from Omega. Omega is, when you look at the history, it's a fantastic brand. And I went several times to the cemetery of Omega. What these guys tell you there are, there are so many people that have worked for Omega. When you hear at the cemetery what they tell you, it's a fantastic brand. I have a lot of admiration, of course, for my, I, I wanted to say my own, for Hublot, which is my biggest achievement in my professional life. This is, uh, you know, somebody asked me, what is the watch you would like to wear when you die? It's a bigger bang, all black in ceramic. Uh, tourbillon chronograph from 2005 and it's a prototype with that watch if I would not have kids I would want to be buried with the watch on the wrist but as I have children it would be it's a pity that I go under the earth <laughs> so <laughs> I would take it off before I die and say come on I, I, I leave it now I can die uh, <laughs> I have a lot of admiration for Hublot uh, uh, I, I, I Recently, I discovered Zenit. Zenit was my biggest doubt in my history. I thought I would never find the way to restore uh, Zenit. <laughs> it was so difficult, and Zenit had done so many trials, and then they were a prisoner of El Primero. So I said, ah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I was really doubting that I could find which message to give to the brand. I found it finally. I found a great CEO. Julien Tornat, an incredible guy, phenomenal guy. You know, Jean-Fred Dufour from Rolex, fantastic man. Ricardo Guadalupe, fantastic guy. Julien Tornat. Uh, so, what I, I, uh, now when, when suddenly a small brand comes out with something fantastic like, uh, like Gröbel and Force, I have admiration for Gröbel and Force because they are producing a museum quality. <laughs> to produce museum quality is not easy. And so you see, I, have, I am not an Ayatollah. I, I am very open <laughs> to, uh, to, yeah. I have even admiration for, I mean even, I have also admiration for Swatch. I bought the Mickey, Mickey Mouse Swatch. Uh, uh, I put an inscription to get one of the first ones. So, you see, I, I, I love watches, so I have not a particular uh, uh, love. I, I love them all for what they are, 
And uh, yeah, that's it. One more. All right, it, I, I will end with this. If you were the king of the watch industry and you by diktat could fix, change, improve anything that's out there now, anything in this, what would it be? We have to, okay, in 1982, if I remember well, came out the first watch. Watch. Mm -hmm. uh, 82 or 81, I don't remember. 82. In 1982, the first watch came out. Was watch in 2000 or in 19, uh, in the 1990s, 2000 till 2010, even later. What role did they play? And this is a role that people constantly underestimate. The role of Swatch was to put a watch on every child from 6 to 16 years old. It was the first time in history that boys and girls, 6, 8, 9, 12 years old, had a watch on their wrist. It had never happened before because of the price and because of the whole structure. Thanks to the plastic watch, thanks to $50 each watch, thanks to the colors, thanks to the marketing, thanks to the joy of life, of life thanks to the fact that you could wear several, thanks to the fact that you could match it to your uh, uh, dress. You have a, a, a yellow uh, shirt, you put a yellow watch on the wrist. This has brought the people, six years old, 15 years old, they have become watch conscious. Before, at five years old, at eight years old, nobody was watch conscious. Nobody was telling, Mama, I want the red swatch because I have a, I have a red shirt. Never this happened before. And when the kids become watch conscious, when they are 6, 15, 18 years old, what happens later? Later, they stay, they will keep watch conscious. And later, they will buy another watch. So Swatch has opened the market to all this generation. And who is doing this today? Who is doing this role? I am asking that somebody replaces Swatch in that role. Who? I hope Apple. I have been not long now in America. I just went to the hotel for the drink. I saw so many people wearing an Apple Watch that I said to myself, maybe Apple can put a watch on each wrist and it's always more easy to sell to somebody an expensive watch when he has already worn a watch than when he has never worn a watch. It's the same for shoes. It's more easy to sell a Berluti pair of shoes to somebody that had Nike shoes or any sneaker on the wrist, on the, the foot, than when he was barefoot. It's always more difficult to, to sell a pair of leather shoes to somebody that has never worn shoes. But if somebody has already worn shoes, but never in leather, one day he might want a leather pair of shoes. So Swatch has played an incredible role in bringing the watch conscious to a new generation that became, that uh, grow up to 20 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old. And that has been one of the reasons, only one, one of the reasons why we had this incredible development of this industry in the 90s and 2000 and 2010, because we have built the youth, the young people. Now, do we do the same with the millenniums? When I see millenniums, when I ask millenniums, they tell me, maybe it's wrong, I don't have enough, uh, uh, the, my uh, advisory board is only six millenniums. But these six millenniums, they never stop telling me we don't want to wear an Apple Watch. 
uh, not Apple. We don't want to wear a connected watch. And we saw with Tag Heuer, people who buy the Tag Heuer connected watch are not the young people. They are people 40, 45 years old. So who is trying to bring the watch conscious in the head of the millenniums? And that is the big challenge we have. And if I had one advice to give, let's try to educate the young, the new generation, so that they become ready to buy naturally when they are 30 years old, or when they get married, or when they get fiancé. Uh, uh, and you know, in the past, people were giving watches to, for good luck. I always say to, to people who buy a watch from me, I say, I have one wish. Now that you bought the watch, I wish this watch, when you wear it on your wrist, that the watch is giving you love, happiness, and success. Because that's why we made this watch. We made this watch by hand. We have put so much passion in it. We have put so much love in it that all this passion, all this love, when you wear it on your wrist, is going into your blood. And that is the message. That's why you buy it. And then people say, oh, I didn't know that I buy it for that reason. I said, but that's the beauty. Now you know it. That's the real reason. And that is why your wife has offered you the watch. Because that's her belief. And then she says, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to educate the millenniums. If we don't educate the millions, we, are, we will be missing a big chunk, a big part of the market of the future. Jean-Claude Beaver, thank you for coming so far to celebrate with us. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to ask that everybody please clear this area because we have to set up for the party. But just, uh, we can all mingle here and John Claude will be here for a few minutes with us. We would like to thank Audemars Piguet, BMW, Cartier, Grand Seiko, Oris, and Zenith for their support in making this weekend possible.